in the 2030s, one of two things will have happened. Either we will have found a completely new fundamental limitation for quantum computing we currently know nothing about. Or we will have scalable, fully fault-tolerant quantum computing. Yeah, I know the meme about quantum computing is that it's always just 10 years away. 10 years later. 10 years from now, it's still going to be 10 years away and so on. And for some reason, even people who know nothing about quantum computing know about this meme. 10 years later. So chances are you do not believe what I said in the intro. And why should you? I'm just a random dude from YouTube. But let me introduce you to Scott Aronson, professor at UT Austin, Texas, and one of the most prominent figures in quantum computing. And crucially, very far removed from floating any hype about quantum computing. Some would say to a fault. And the sentence from the intro was actually said by him. Now, if he's actually against hype, why would he say something like that? There are, of course, many challenges, but there is one central issue that will decide in large parts between success or failure of quantum computing. And that issue is noise. All of a quantum computer's advantages rest on things like superpositions or entanglement, and those are quickly degraded or destroyed by noise. Now, fixing noise will not immediately solve all the issues in quantum computing, but not fixing noise means there will never be any useful quantum computing to speak of. The classical approaches to error correction cannot be applied to quantum computers. But already in the 90s, the first approaches for quantum error correction were found. And several more have been invented since. This is a big topic and deserves its own video, but for now, it will suffice that these things are possible in principle, assuming our theories about quantum noise are accurate. Now, quantum noise can either originate from the environment outside of the quantum computer, or from quantum effects inside of the quantum computer, or from errors introduced by the computation itself. Each operation the quantum computer performs, each uh, quantum gate as we call it, only has a certain reliability to do what it is supposed to do, which we call fidelity. The remarkable threshold theorem of quantum computing says that this fidelity does not have to be arbitrarily close to 100%, but only has to achieve a certain fixed value. This was initially 99.99999% but using our best methods known today, it is only 99.99% .99 fidelity. This means that if we can perform the most complicated operations within our quantum computer, which are the two qubit gates, with a fidelity of 99.99%, we correct more errors than we introduce and quantum computing will work. We couldn't do better than 50% fidelity in the 90s, but in the last 10 to 15 years, this grew quickly to 90% and then 95% and 99%. Today, several realizations of quantum computers are approaching 99.9% .9 and all our theories and error models are holding up so far. Now, the, the way from 99.9 .9 to 99.99 .99 will not be trivial. But from all we know today and from all we've learned over the past decades, there is no fundamental physics problem here. It is only an engineering problem and it appears to be attainable, especially as the money definitely is in there now as well. So that's where we are today. We know where we have to go and we know how to get there. It will not be an easy path, but there does not seem to be any fundamental roadblock. So projecting the current trend lines, fault tolerant, scalable quantum computing falls well within the 2030s. One thing my regular viewers already know is that 
it isn't clear yet what exact technology the quantum computers will eventually be based on. And interestingly, this question is still very much open. The most visually iconic is the chandelier-style superconducting quantum computer used by IBM or Google. Contrary to popular belief, the golden chandelier isn't the actual computer itself though. It is the cooling unit that is necessary because we can only get superconductivity at extremely low temperatures, very close to zero degrees. The actual quantum computer is the chip at the bottom of this and looks like this. Google Sycamore. It is basically a superconducting resonance circuit and there are some alternatives as to what can act as the qubit. For example, the direction in which the electrical charges are flowing. Microsoft and Continuum are working on the trapped iron quantum computer, where strings of ions are trapped in an electromagnetic field, a so-called Powell trap. The ions used have two energy levels that can be used as qubits and are typically operated on with lasers. The actual traps are very small and look like this, though the entire experimental setup is much larger, more like this. A relatively recent success was the neutral atom quantum computer, championed by QERA. These are in many ways similar to trapped ion setups, but use neutral atoms instead of ions. These are captured in a magneto-optical trap and also use energy levels of the atoms as qubits, which are operated on by lasers. One of the big selling points of neutral atom quantum computers is that they can use highly excited states of the atoms, so-called Rydberg states, to influence nearby atoms. And these can be used to implement the important two-qubit gates. Now, these are the architectures that seem to be ahead right now, but there are others, like photonics and spin-based quantum computers. It looks like we might get several different working variants of quantum computers. Like the Manhattan Project that produced both a uranium gun assembly bomb and a plutonium implosion bomb. And from there, economics will decide which way to proceed. Now, assuming all of this will actually happen, what does it mean for applications and for users? Initially, we will probably run some quantum simulations with possible applications to chemistry and material science, for example, because these offer the biggest quantum advantage and also are more straightforward to do. But the big thing that all governments and all companies need to pay close attention to is quantum computers can run Shor's algorithm to efficiently solve the factorization problem. In essence, they can calculate in which prime numbers a very large number can be factorized. Now this may sound very innocuous, but it is actually very relevant because this problem is the basis for almost all of our current encryption schemes. This mathematical problem secures your bank account, your company's emails and the CIA's biggest secrets. So we clearly need to replace those with some encryption methods that cannot be broken by quantum computers. And uh, this has been known for decades and there are now some solutions being worked on that are ready or almost ready. So from today's perspective, this will hopefully just be an organizational problem and not a technological one. Still, it might become a race, at least in some parts. So um, it will be interesting to see how this turns out. Now, maybe you're still unconvinced because you like the 10 years meme so much. 10 years later. But this is exactly how a lot of technologies developed. AI, for example, has been worked on since the 1960s and progress has been slow for decades and it looked like a century away and it was all very silly. Until it wasn't. Until somebody actually made it work.